Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, The Hartwig Family, Hush Blackwell, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly. Our topics this week, signs of resistance to the Vote Fraud Commission, signs the KCI debate is far from over, and no sign that the J.C. Nichols Fountain debate is drying up, plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and talk with one of the principal players in Kansas Democratic politics and state government, the minority leader of the House, Jim Ward of Wichita. Mr. Ward previously served in the state Senate and has been in the House since 2003. He's on a short list of Democrats being talked about as potential candidates for the gubernatorial nomination next year. Perhaps we'll find out in the next few minutes if that speculation is valid. Mr. Leader, welcome to Ruckus. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I look forward to the conversation. For folks who don't spend their days checking in on Kansas state government, uh, how would you define the role of minority leader of the House? Um, obviously two parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. We have 125 members. The Democrats constitute about a third or 40 um, and I am their leader and we'll try to help keep us organized and informed about issues before we vote. Uh, there was a time not too many years ago when we would see so-called moderate Republicans work with Democrats when people said there were three political parties in Kansas, Democrats, moderate Republicans, conservative Republicans. That changed, I think, during the Brownback era, but it appears it might be changing back. Absolutely. In, in the Kansas House of our 125, it's about a third Democrat a third moderate Republican and a third ultra conservative. But remember, all Democrats don't think alike, all moderate Republicans don't think alike. And so you get a range from really conservative moderate to very liberal moderate, and it's a challenge every day to put the 63 together. When you go back into session, and I realize there may be a special session between now and then, but talking about January of 2018, do you think there'll be more cooperation between so-called moderate Republicans and leading Democrats? There will be, and we did a lot of cooperation this year, but we don't all think alike, so it's, we have to work through some of the challenges to get to those compromises. It's like they say, you don't want to see sausage or laws being made, but at the end of the day, I think we came up with some very good, serious steps forward to rebuild Kansas. I'm sure you were among those who advocated a tax increase. I did think we had to reform our income tax system in Kansas. It was wrong to have 330,000 people use services and not pay income tax. It was a based on a flawed theory that Kansas could eliminate income tax, and we repealed both of those things and we added a third bracket, right. which is the higher end. People 60,000 and over. Uh, is this going to be enough money? We're waiting for the Supreme Court. Um, it's close. Uh, remember, if you went back to 2012 before the tax experiment, we still cut taxes from right. that rate. Yeah. Um, so we're still struggling to find that okay, sweet spot. The state legislature has allocated, I think, $193 million more to the schools. And then before that is resolved in the Supreme Court, the school districts, including yours in Wichita, mine in Kansas City, Kansas, already asking for $1.5 billion more. If the state Supreme Court says, yeah, that's the right figure, what does the legislature do? It'd be a big challenge. $1.5 billion is real money, even for state government, and it would be difficult. Luckily, they're not asking for it all in one year. We'd have to phase in and over a period of time. Is there no end to how much money schools should receive in Kansas? Um, I'm not really sure how to take that question. Well, it, let me clarify it. Uh, nobody seems to know how much is enough. Do you know how much is enough? Well, there's not enough enough. Because what? what happens, just like at your house... But you can't give me a figure. Well, let me explain why. It, it, just like your gas prices keep going up every year, the cost of running schools. So once we get a formula and a method of funding schools that's based on needs, then you get, that, that, you get in that sweet spot for enough. You're an attorney. Wouldn't it be helpful if the state Supreme Court suggested a figure? Well, about 10 years ago, they actually did that and the ultra-right conservatives just about lost their minds about separation of power and the Supreme Court over-exceeding. What the court does is set the parameters and identify the flaws, and we're supposed to fill in as public officials. Let's get to the big news. Are you going to run for governor? <laughs> not today, I'm not. I will tell you some serious people that I respect have been talking to me about it for the last couple of weeks. Are you leaning toward it? 
Well, I'm obviously listening. When you get Is that why you're in this area, to visit with uh, political people? Um, I do that. I also have several members in the Johnson County area and the Wyandotte County area that I keep touch with as leader to make sure that they're ready for the next election. If you choose to run, what one or two topics would you be emphasizing? Continuing to fiscal responsibility, we took some good steps forward this year, but we're not done. And that includes making sure our schools are top quality. We've got to repeal this concept that government goes away. There are certain essential core services, and I'll have a conversation with the people of Kansas about how to do that. Great to talk with you. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for having me, sir. You bet. That is the minority leader of the Kansas House, Jim Ward. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus! Lisa Johnston is a columnist and political consultant. Steve Rose is a Johnson County civic leader and a columnist with the Kansas City Star. Mike Sanders is the former Jackson County executive, now in private practice with Humphrey, Farrington, and McLean. And Patrick Tui is field manager at the Show Me Institute in Kansas City, a free market think tank. While discussion continues over the propriety of J.C. Nichols' name remaining on a fountain in the Country Club Plaza he pioneered and built, the issue was raised by Kansas City Star columnist Steve Kraske, who wants the name removed. He cites Nichols' racist behaviors in his dealings with minorities, particularly African Americans and Jews. Nichols, a major developer and builder in Kansas City, lived from 1880 to 1950 and imposed restrictive deeds on neighborhoods he developed. Kraske says he received several hundred responses to his column, 75% of which were supportive. Among the other 25% is Steve Rose, who also outlined his views in a Kansas City Star column, and I hope will do so now. Well, I'd be happy to, but first I want to go on record as saying that although I didn't receive hundreds, I may have received a hundred, I didn't get a single person descending from what I wrote. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, the people who, you know, I did, this is the first column I think I've ever written, as a matter of fact, in my life, where I didn't get one dissension. I think it's because uh, people understand that this is outside the box. I mean, it is not fair to judge J.C. Nichols today on the standards and, and for norms of his time. Every major developer in the country was using these restrictions. As a matter of fact, in Levittown, New York, which was, as we all probably know, was a mass uh, developed area like, like Nichols did, um, the developer was Jewish. And he had restrictions against Jews living in his area. And I believe was, they were legal until 1948, until the Supreme Court ruled in 48, and later the Fair Housing Act, I think. That's was right. 1960. And, and the Fair Housing Act is the one, the only one that actually undid the Crow Brothers and Leewood. They were they hang they hung in there till the end, not allowing Jews and not allowing blacks to live in Leewood. And you said your family, your Jewish family, had a connection with Nichols, and he treated your family very well. Well, my parents moved into Prairie Village in 1947. They didn't really even know anything about the covenants, and they put down their $75 for their Cape Cod house in Prairie Village, and uh, they got a call uh, from the Nichols Company and said, you may not be comfortable here. You're the only Jewish people that would be living here. Your neighbors may not be comfortable, but if you want to buy, you buy. So they did, and you know, I grew up there, and I, I to, my, to this day, I can say I've never seen any anti-Semitism. And, and, and you said the Nichols Company helped your family's newspaper get started. My folks started a paper in 1950, and uh, Nichols owned the Prairie Village Shopping Center. He wanted the newspaper to succeed and paid all the mailing costs for delivery to everybody who, was, who lived there for almost a year. Mike Sanders, you've been around Kansas City all your life. Have you ever heard this controversy erupt before? Believe it or not, yes. It re reminded me of a conversation uh, my family, we used to take on Sundays, we take drives. And one of the things my parents would do is teach us the history of Kansas City. So I can go back to when I was eight years old in 1975. I'm kind of dating myself, but driving around with my family. And this was, frankly, one of the topics we talked about was the history of discrimination, the truce boundary, the J.C. Nichols issue with regards to restrictive uh, covenants within deeds. And so it was a topic within my family. You ever heard about this, Patrick, until just now? Uh, about the effort specifically to rename Well, about the, the naming of the fountain, yes, I know, removing the name. I, I, I tend to agree with Steve a little bit. I think uh, going back and judging people against modern standards is wrong. The real problem in Kansas City is that we still have uh, 
kind of a, a racial, bigoted economic development policies uh, that uh, that tax the poor in order to subsidize developments for the rich mm -hmm. in Kansas City, in downtown Kansas City, we are subsidizing, taxpayers are subsidizing a high-rise luxury apartment building in a school district with 90% free and reduced meal lunches. So we are we are spending money on the rich in a poor community. And, and that is the legacy, frankly, of these economic development policies, and that's what ought to be upsetting people, not the name on a fountain. Lisa, if the Nichols name were removed from the fountain on the plaza, will this ease the pain of past racism or will it just remind victims of it? I don't think that it will ease the pain. I mean, it won't change what happened, obviously. And the point that I've made when I've discussed this recently is that if we went back and scrubbed names of anyone who was engaged in any kind of what we consider now unsavory, inappropriate, distasteful practice during the course of the history, whether it was slave ownership of the founders or this case with J.C. Nichols or people who were sexist over the years, we'd be scrubbing names off a lot of things. And I think that the focus would be better spent on trying to, as Patrick was alluding, improve things for people now. There was a column from Charles Hammer, I take it, was a former reporter for the Star who now writes a monthly column. He's retired as a reporter, I guess, and he suggested a truce wall <laughs> where he said it should be erected, I believe, on Main Street and black figures placed east of the wall and white figures west of the wall. Does that make any sense at all as, as a way to deal with racism's past? And you're looking at me. So, so whether it makes sense, look, I, I think the truce wall was a real wall. I mean, yeah. it, it was theoretical in nature. I think it existed. Nichols was part of that truce wall. So I think it's real history of Kansas City. However, the question becomes who ought to pay for it? I mean, should the government be spending millions of dollars to erect a truce wall? I'm not sure that's the best use of public funds, but I think a recognition of that political reality, that racial reality of our past is real. By constructing this truce wall? Uh, the no, 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 no. I, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the truce wall was real. Yeah, oh, in yeah. Terms of our history. Don't, we don't need in terms uh, of construction. Uh, yeah. No, I, may, I, may I, I jump in here to say that the Nichols family, two people called me from the Nichols family. I did not know that the taxpayers had nothing to do with this fountain. It was built and paid for by Miller Nichols, his son, uh, mm, and yeah. it is maintained by the Nichols Foundation. So the Nichols Foundation would be the ones to remove it if anybody removed it, I right? I think that would be right. Yeah. Because I heard last week Gwen Grant was on the program and, and in her toast or roast said that uh, there might be a petition campaign underway to get the name off the fountain, but that would have to go to the Nichols Foundation. I would imagine so, unless they gave the rights to So the we're city. not saying I build that wall on this <laughs> okay. As we've discussed before, President Trump has named a commission on election integrity to study such things as voter fraud, which Trump believes caused him to lose the popular vote last year by three million. The commission's vice chairman is Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach, who is finding resistance and outright opposition to his request that states provide the names, addresses, dates of birth, party affiliation, partial social security numbers, and voting history of residents going back to 2006. Kobach says most, if not all, of that material he wants is public information, easily acquired by candidates and interest groups. Trump's critics and others say voting fraud is not a problem in this country. Others, including the president and Kobach, believe it is. So should this commission be given a chance to find out which point of view is true? Patrick. I think it's, a, it's an embarrassment, this big kerfuffle over the request. So what the, uh, Chris Kobach requested is public information. In some states, the last four digits of your social security number are public. In some states, there aren't. In fact, this is how political pollsters, one thing I used to do, collect information. You go and buy this information uh, from the state. So I think it's, a, it's an opportunity for people to politically posture, but the commission will end up getting this information and proceed. I was disappointed with the Kansas City Star's editorial against this, saying that what we should really be worried about is what Kobach's going to do with the information. You're a news gathering organization. Do you want the government to say to you when you file sunshine requests, what are you going to do with the information? You know, at the very least, uh, the federal government could buy this information from each of the states it, if necessary. The states will, look, if it's public information, they will have to turn it over. Uh, and, uh, and, and if they resist that, I'm sure somebody could go and just pay for those voting. Does anybody know if Social Security numbers, the last four numbers, are public information? In some states it, it is. Something, in Kansas, it it's is not. It is it, not public in information. In the state of Missouri, it is not. But, uh, you know, I just want to say the, yeah. the perception, I think, it, I think Kobach, in this case, is tone deaf. 
uh, much like Chris Christie was when he went to the beach uh, when, he, when the beaches were closed. Um, I think if you ask the average person, would you like all that list of information going to the federal government, I think they'd be absolutely outraged. I don't think he's on the right side of the people on this particular issue. But, but Lisa, wouldn't this be a great way to discredit Donald Trump by those who would like to do it if this report showed absolutely very little voter fraud, if any at all? Which is what I think they would and will find presuming they're allowed to go forward. And, and, and it assuming reaches the a commission conclusion. would do the work fairly and accurately. Correct, correct. I mean, I think it needs to go forward. At one time in the world's history, people believed the earth was flat. And not and until the boats, not. <laughs> boats sailed out and they <laughs> figured out it didn't fall off the edge, did they say, okay, maybe it's not flat. I think, I think we need an answer to this. It's too distracting. It's a shame because every study that's ever been done has shown very, very little. And I think that that's exactly what's going to be found here, just as it was in Kansas. However, I think it's important to resolve this and move forward to more important topics. Well, well, Mike, there are those who think the results will be rigged to support the Trump position. Do you fear that? Uh, look, I mean, I, I think you've got Chris Kobach and Donald Trump who have clearly expressed their belief that there's been massive voter fraud. I'll just tell you from my experience in the state of Missouri, you've got a greater likelihood within Jackson <laughs> County or the state of Missouri of being struck and killed by lightning uh, than over the last 20 years finding a submissible case of voter fraud. I think Chris Kobach and uh, Donald Trump have clearly expressed what their belief is. Uh, so putting these two individuals essentially in charge of a commission, this is a an investigation in search of evidence to support their but case. But it is a bipartisan commission, not it, just all Republicans. It are. is, but if you really wanted to, to, to really make this objective and appear completely objective in terms of what the results would be, I don't think Chris Kobach would be serving you're, on this You're the only attorney on the panel, and God Kobach, has, yes, uh, Kobach has said that uh, the federal government has the authority to order the states to comply, the Justice Department could do that. Do you know if that's true? Well, I, I think in certain contexts that could be the case. Certainly the Department of Justice could do that. But, uh, but I look at it, if I'm the Secretary of State of the state of Missouri, which I'm not, uh, if I look at that and there are certain bits of information that state statute precludes me from disposing of or giving to even, this, even the federal government, what do you do when you've got this conundrum of the federal government's requesting, but I can't give some of this data over? I think uh, that's why 44 <laughs> secretaries of state throughout the country have objected to various parts of this information being provided to the federal government. Well, well Pat Patrick, one part of this study is to look into voter suppression, and minority groups constantly are saying Republicans are trying to suppress the vote. Wouldn't it be helpful to have this commission study voter suppression and do away with it if it exists? Uh, absolutely, I think so. Uh, and, and I think that the panelists who have said that this is an opportunity to investigate and it may not stand up under scrutiny uh, is an opportunity. But but to uh, to what the letter actually said, you know, the letter to Connecticut, for example, said, uh, please provide this uh, voter roll data for Connecticut, including if publicly available <clears throat> under the laws of your state. So they haven't requested anything that's illegal. But again, it's an opportunity for people to when, I when Kobach wanted to get prosecutorial powers in Kansas, he said, he said before the legislature, there are hundreds of cases in Kansas of voter fraud. And he got the power and he found 12 cases. He hasn't exactly. had time to investigate them all, Steve. He's takes, got a, it takes a while. He's got a long list in his drawer, does he, Mike? People should be prepared for this to be Al Capone's vault. The, the, yeah. Nothing's going to be there. It's quickly, Steve. Is this yeah. going to help or hurt Kobach's race for governor? Oh, God, it'll probably unbelievably help him. I can't believe it, but Raises I have profile. to say the truth. No, I think it'll help him. No, I right. think this is a winner nationally, too. I agree with Steve, uh, for yeah. better or worse. Okay, got to move on. The Kansas City Star has decided we need a new airport and is beginning a series of editorials to explain why. In its first edict, the editorial board makes these observations. The airport is not convenient. Frequent flyers know convenience is a myth. It is not welcoming. It's dark and tunnel-like and difficult for travelers to find a bar, restaurant, or shopping, perhaps because there's none there. It is not secure. <laughs> the scattered security sites once thought to be a convenience and strength actually are not. And it's not sustainable in the long run. It is cheaper to build a new KCI than renovate the current one. So do you find yourself nodding in agreement with the STARS assessment or writing off what the paper has written. We'll start with Lisa. I don't agree with the assessment. KCI is not perfect, but it is functional. And I think that that's what most people who fly in and out of KCI want. They're not there to lounge around and go to a restaurant and shop for things. For the most part, they want to get in, get on their plane and go, get back, get to their car and go home. And many folks who are advocating for a new airport have 
made this argument about, oh, it's not convenient. But frankly, if you park at the terminal, I have been able to get to my car after I get off the plane in five minutes and get on the road, which is wonderful. The longest part of getting to my car usually is getting off the plane itself. So there, there are some real convenience aspects. Yes, there are some security concerns, but then also it's advantageous sometimes to have two different terminals. I remember an incident in one case where there was an unattended bag in one terminal and they shut down that terminal but they continued to operate the other which we wouldn't be able to do if we only had one terminal. So it's a cost-benefit analysis. Is it really worth the investment at this point? And I'm not inclined to agree at this point in time with going forward with the new uh, in terminal. In fact, uh, a pipe broke earlier this week and the restrooms were closed in one of the terminals and people had to be transported by bus to another terminal to use the facilities. Hmm. But let me ask that same question of you, Mike. Do you find yourself nodding in agreement with the STAR or kind of writing off what they're suggesting? I, I generally do. I think something has to be done with the airport. So I agree with the conclusion, but not for the reasons uh, that, that I think the STAR expressed. You know, one of the things that I had experience in doing is over about a 13 or 14 year period, one of the things that we did is we brought in delegations, potential CEOs, business heads that wanted to locate to Kansas City. And whether we like it or not, uh, when they land at KCI, that is the front door. That is the front gate to our community. And I can tell you universally, without exception, whether it's convention delegations, CEOs, business leaders, when they land at KCI, the impression of Kansas City is not positive, but in fact, very, very poor. Airports in so many ways are also, they do many things, but they're also drivers of economic activity. If I'm gonna locate my Fortune 500 company, I'm gonna locate it in a community where I can get my senior level managers, myself, my, my, my business individuals in and out of KCI to go to Berlin or Tokyo. And KCI universally is not a location where that can be done well. At, at, as of this moment, uh, Patrick, the star, to my knowledge, has not indicated whether it wants the terminal privately financed or financed by public dollars through airport bonds. Yeah. What is your preference? Uh, you know, uh, <coughs> public financing is uh, much, much cheaper. And it is a standard way that cities have financed projects like this. Uh, Burns and McDonald says that uh, they can get uh, uh, loans, they can get financing for just as cheap, but I don't know that they've told us how. Um, unfortunately, I don't think anybody is surprised that the Kansas City Star came out and endorsed a new terminal. They, they always want to uh, spend more public funds. The, the problem here, which they didn't address, uh, is, is the impact of the cost. We have had other airports in other cities, Indianapolis, San Jose, Sacramento, that have spent billion dollars plus, and the cost to service that debt not to taxpayers, but to flyers and airlines. But you're making the argument, actually, Patrick, you're making the argument to go with the private financing because that doesn't have the risk that you're describing right now. And as a matter of fact, when you look at the polls, it says 38% of the people, only 38% of Kansas Cityans wanted a new airport, given that. However, when you ask them, what if it's privately financed, the number jumps to the mid-50s. And the answer is to what's the correlation is mistrust. They do, and I think it would be almost impossible to pass public financing That's when private, except, wait, private could win, public could never win. Got, I've got to stop the, it there. Oh. Uh, almost out of time. I do want to mention Ray Kowalik, who is president and CEO of Burns and McDonald, the company that began this concept of private financing of KCI, will be our guest in the first segment of Ruckus next week. Now we head to the soapbox for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckets have 30 seconds each to upend or defend people and events in the news, and we start with Mike Sanders. It's hard not to completely excoriate uh, New Jersey's Governor Chris Christie for his most recent moment in the sun, uh, where he took his family on an all-expense-paid helicopter trip, ride, and trip uh, to a beach that he had previously closed. Uh, the, the caption or headline uh, on the photograph easily could have read, let them eat funnel cake. Uh, for Chris Christie, I think it's unfortunate that actions speak much louder than words, and that's why he remains this country's least popular governor. Steve. I'd like to roast, and this is a segue from our earlier conversation, Catherine Shields, who is the one legislator who is pushing for public financing. I think Catherine Shields wants to run for mayor, and this is a way of making a name for herself. But I can tell you, it, will, it would sink like a stone, and she should rethink her position. She has Mike Sanders as her potential campaign manager. Did you know that? No question. <laughs> your, your friendship and cooperation go way back. Absolutely. All right, Patrick. Uh, my roast today is for the unified government of Wyandotte County and Kansas City, Kansas for incredibly 
uh, almost following suit in St. Louis and Kansas City. But instead of subsidizing successful sports teams, they have doubled down on subsidizing a loser. The T-Bones literally cannot pay to keep the lights on, yet the taxpayers of the unified government are chipping in uh, to uh, in another example of crony capitalism, and the unified government should be ashamed. And Lisa. A roast to the ever-increasing political tribalism that has resulted in reflexively demonizing those in the opposing party while mindlessly supporting those in one's own party. This dynamic is part of the reason why I have changed my political affiliation officially to unaffiliated or independent. We must find a way to break through this dynamic of political entrenchment and find a way forward that doesn't undermine our nation. America deserves better. I thought you were coming over to the GOP. <laughs> Guess not. Sorry to disappoint. And finally, here's a roast to House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi for her recent megalomaniacal display following suggestions that her leadership was hurting the Democratic Party. So you want me to sing my praises? Is that what you're saying? Why should I? Well, I'm a... Um master legislator. I am a, a, a strategic, politically astute leader. Uh, let me slightly alter a quote from Charles de Gaulle that goes this way, graveyards are filled with indispensable women. And that's Ruckus for this time. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckets and the crew, I'm Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night. Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, The Hartwig Family, Hush Blackwell, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, and by viewers like you. Thank you.